This week on FX Guide TV. We talked to DreamWorks Animation about their new animated feature Turbo and the use of Houdini with OpenVDB in their pipeline. This and more coming up next. Hello, I'm Angie Dale. Now, before we start this week, this podcast is a free service from FX Guide. If you'd like to support the work that we do, then there are two ways that you can help. Firstly, you can become an FX Guide Insider supporter. Now, this means you pay $49 a year, and as a thank you, we provide a bunch of exclusive additional content throughout the year. The second is just by being a part of our sister site, fxphd.com. Now, FXPHD provides serious professional training in VFX, editing, audio, and production, and it comes with its own free weekly show, Background Fundamentals. FX Guide does small amounts of advertising, but mainly we are user-supported and user-driven. After all, all of us came from or work in the industry. Well, that's my pledge drive. Now on with the show. I wish I was fast. Oh no. What's happening to me? There's a big sequence that is kind of outside that normal workflow of what you do as a FX department. That's the uh, spider bite sequence. Correct. Um, w you tackled it basically in the entire department, everything from start to finish yourself. Why did you have to do that or why did you decide to do that? Um, so we were early on in production and uh, we didn't have that much work. And when I saw, I remember when I saw the first screening and I saw uh, kind of a previous version of that sequence, I thought it was like a great, great things to do in the, in the effects department. Um, and uh, I pitched the idea to the visual effects supervisor, Sean Phillips, and uh, he said, absolutely, why not? Uh, so I said, good. So for me, it was kind of like my baby that be. So um, it, was, uh, it was good because we, could, we started early on, uh, even before the assets were ready, because we ended up basically creating everything and uh, because we work in, uh, in Udini and uh, Udini, we use Mantra for rendering our volumes. I knew that we could have easily uh, finished the sequence completely in FX. And, uh, and that was what happened and was challenging, but it was like a big, big uh, satisfaction for us. Well, let's talk about the challenges of it. I mean, how long did it take to actually come up with that whole sequence? Because you're starting, I mean, obviously you had some concepts with it, but it's something that's not rooted in physical reality. Yeah, well, we started with like some, uh, some concept artwork from uh, the art department. They were actually pretty detailed, but you know, they were stills. Uh, and uh, the previous department or rough layout department, they also put something together for the timing. And that was kind of our starting points. Um, the, the idea was, the idea behind was to make really sure that the audience uh, knows what we're doing, that we're going inside Turbo's body and that this blue liquid is somehow changing the, is like DNA or something. Um, and uh, so that was the, the big like point, selling point for the director. So our challenge was to make something that looks cool, that we had fun doing it and was actually selling the, the story point. Um, so. Um, we kind of like uh, started like doing our own research, find some images on the internet, uh, some reference from previous movie like Spider-Man. That's why the sequence name is Spider-Bite. There was also, there was Prometheus out there. They have kind of like the same DNA change in sequence. So we took a lot of reference and of course we are making a cartoon. So we had to come up with our own styles. The good thing is that because it's such a different moment, we have kind of more freedom. Um, and so we basically we started and started showing to the director until uh, he was happy. Uh, well, what were some interesting aspects of that sequence or, you know, challenges that you solved uh, in building that sequence? Well, the first thing is that uh, it's a stereo movie turbo and uh, we were dealing each individual beat as a different scene. Uh, so the scale wasn't really like coherent with uh, like we were going smaller and smaller and then we come back out. So the camera setting were like the stereo setting were set up for each individual scene. So what we did, we didn't care about the, the, the blending between shots until we get all the look approved. Everything was there. Um, and then we went back and started like figuring out how we're going to blend the two scenes. We, we really use kind of like a, a live action approach, a lot of compositing. Um, and uh, so we had to, to kind of some, some time we had to extend maybe the shot a little bit to have enough frame to do this 
gradual blend that was done in compositing. And we were adjusting the eye separation to make sure the transition in stereo looks good. Uh, that was one of the challenge. Um, and uh, also the other challenge was like uh, getting like something that was really selling the point, as I said before, was very important, uh, especially when we get to the atomic level. Uh, we, uh, the artist John Yaxel, which was also leading the sequences and uh, my effects lead, he was really trying to push for something very, very like uh, physical. And, you know, at the beginning we had kind of like, a, it looks like a, a galaxy in the space, but for the director it was too much. So we also had to do a step back there and try to do something that was making the director happy, but it also looks, uh, looks cool. What about having, I mean, you mentioned the switch to Houdini or using Houdini as part of that, but what, what about that enabled you to bite off that sequence? That was, uh, that's one of, one of the reasons why we decided also to take it into the effects department because we knew that we could have started, we were getting cameras from the layout department and then once we're in Houdini, we basically stayed in Houdini the whole process until compositing. We use Mantra a lot, we have uh, uh, all our, a lot of proprietary uh, tools in Houdini, we do all our fluid simulation with a custom uh, fluid solver called Flux, we, we, we put all the volume into VDBs, so we had basically all we needed in one single package, and uh, it was very straightforward, surfacing, rendering, everything was happening in one application, and that was make it really like possible. Uh, deep compositing is a big buzzword right now, but then you talk right. to people and using it as a different story. But you actually did use it on the yeah, sequence we did for do really that. good reasons. Uh, yeah, exactly. We, we did use, uh, in a few of these uh, transformation uh, process, we use deep compositing, mostly to deal with the uh, depth of field, uh, true depth of field in compositing and motion blur, and to not to worry too much about uh, what object I took cut out, what other object. Especially when you have a semi-transparent object, doing this single cutout weight, you always get some artifacts in the edge, unless you you do two-way cutout, you know, and then you add them together. So we didn't ever wanted to worry about what to cut out with what. So we were rendering all the elements as deep images, and then we use Nuke deep compositing to put everything together and add uh, like nice depth of field. Uh, that was uh, that was good. Um, it's still like I think it's still a little bit slow as a process. And uh, I don't think we're ready to do a whole moving deep compositing, but there are, I think the see there are put, uh, like aspect that is uh, interesting to maybe start in deep compositing and then flatten everything and finish it. So was it the file size dealing with the render? What was the part that weighted it down? Well, the, the file size is bigger, of course, right. because you have all the depth information, and the tool that we use uh, um, to like create depth of field is low because you have to analyze, take each pixel at each depth and apply depth of field. Um, so it makes it kind of uh, complicated in that aspect, and also you can't really stay in deep for the whole process because uh, you have a, a limited set of tools that deal with deep data. Uh, you can blur, you can do a lot of things. And so at one point of the process, you have to go flatten everything and use the regular, like the typical 2D compositing pipeline. So I still see it is a little bit something that uh, for our needs is not really like uh, necessary to go there. Sometimes it's good though, especially when, you know, you deal with like volume that uh, to to be to live in the same uh, space as like a geometry, so you just uh, render in deep format, and then you don't have to worry about the cutout process. And you mentioned two D compositing. Then the trick of the heart actually making the transformation was not actually volumetric, right? You yeah, correct. 2D. The artist uh, uh, was trying to do three uh, D simulations um, at the time, fluid simulation in three D, uh, and. Uh, it was like complicated because you had to deal with complex collision or deforming geometry. And uh, besides that, we couldn't really get the detail that, that I wanted to see kind of like uh, typical fluid stimulation mushroom style that you never want to see. I wanted to see it there and we couldn't in 3D because we couldn't have the detail. So I pitched them the idea to try to do a 2D simulation and then uh, figure out something, how to map it into the, the, the geometry and do a lot of compositing work. Uh, in fact, the, the hard part, as I think is the one that has more layer and is all built in compositing and nuke. Um, and it was successful, you know, the, you would never tell you that it is, uh, it is 3, 2D and that's exactly the goal was that, right? Yeah, and, but, and also the benefit though of doing it entirely within your team, I'm sure made Absolutely. that process yeah. much, much yeah. easier as well. Well, let's switch to another uh, effect that's omnipresent throughout uh, the film and that's the trail for Turbo, tur tra yeah. turbo Trail. What, what was that development process like? 
there was a, so the Turbo Trader was developed by Matt Titus, which was also one of my lead. And he, I would say that he basically took care of all the shots of Turbo Trader. He was overseeing all the production uh, of the Turbo Trader. Uh, the problem with the Turbo Trader was that uh, in, when, when you have such an important effects element that goes with a character, it's always better if uh, that the look get kind of established during the biz dev phase of the production. Um, like in the art department, you know, it's part of the character. So it would have been good to have some something more well defined. We know that uh, the director wanted a blue streak. Uh, we knew that we couldn't do anything that looked like slime. That was another important process. And uh, we knew that we had challenges because Turbo is actually like actually animated at 180 miles per hour. So he moves in reality, he moves that fast. So we. Uh, spend a lot of time figuring out what was the best approach and which was the best look. So we worked probably like we started like nine, ten months before we went into actual production, doing some tests and doing some 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 look dev and some some some, some animation test. And the director actually liked it. And about uh, two three months after we started, and then we waited until we went into production and we put in the first sequence, and nobody liked it because. We had like actual animation, and uh, what we did wasn't really working well, so we have to go back and make adjustments. So it kind of evolved uh, over the, the course of like nine, ten months, kind of nine months, like making a baby. <laughs> and uh, we finally got to a point where everybody was happy. The trail is actually made up of a lot of significant pieces. Can you walk us through the various parts of what goes together to make the trail? Yes, we have, well, the, the main aspect of the, 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 the trail is actually this trail, blue trail, that is like a bunch of little curves. And these are also rendered in Mantra, and they were actually rendered without alpha channels, so they are additive on top of each other. Then we have, uh, we have an extra element, which is a volume, a VDB volume, which is sit between the, because the curves come from the side of the, the, the shell. In some shot, when you're basically, when you're like looking behind, it looks very weird to see these two, like streaks with no uh, volume inside. So we had an extra element where you're only using in certain situation, which fill basically the gaps between the twos. Uh, and then we have um, a thread mark that actually turbo leaves on the ground, which is procedure generated. And uh, it's, it creates like a really like a, a thread mark from a typical tires. And uh, that also has been, uh, and is all time based on, uh, on what turbo does. And on top of this treadmill, we also have a kind of like a fiery, smoky element that connect everything together. So there are like a, a lot of elements that go together, balanced by the artist. And finally, we have also this swirl on the side of the turbo shell, which like a uh, rev up and rev down. Um, so this is the main component of the, the, the turbo, turbo trade. Now you spent a lot of time in development on that, but in the end, the way you set it up for the artist, it was actually fairly straightforward and quick to Absolutely. actually do it in the end, right? Absolutely. Matt Titus put together this OTL, this Houdini OTL, that uh, it was really straightforward. You drop it into your Houdini scenes, attach it to, to Turbo, and you already have, like, if you just simulate and play and render, you have already out of the box a pass. It looks okay, you know, always, but it was very good because we could really like go propagate all the effects on the sequence and then the artist was going on a shot per shot and unless it was some complicated hero shots, like I would say that uh, a good artist could, could like uh, do three shots a day. So it was pretty efficient and it was very easy to, to address notes and, you know, it was, uh, it was also inherit some of the information from the animation department that had a control, uh, a core that they could control and uh, kind of bend the, the, the trailer even more smoothly. We could inherit that information. So it was pretty efficient, actually. And I want to touch on that because what's happening there, right, is the, the turbo is moving so quickly that if you actually look at the animation frame by frame, it would become a straight example. Exactly. Each frame would be uh, like a, a linear, polygon. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, this, uh, this, this shot was one of the first shots that uh, was an early shot that we did where turbo come and do like a big turn and come to a stop and it goes so fast that of course it's like doing like a straight line. So in that case, having this tube that animation, the animation department could control help us a lot because we didn't have to go and adjust manually uh, the, the curve. So that was very useful. Because the alternative would be what? Increase the simulation? Yeah, we were like doing like, uh, we use a trace up and we had, we'd have to like interpolate ourselves as well. And, and then we also have in, the, in our control, we have some, some sphere that were kind of influencing the, the trail 
and we could bend it a little bit, but uh, it was much easier to let somebody else take care of that. And because also animation could approve Turbo with the trade, it was actually help them to see better what Turbo was doing. Um, so it was, a, it was a good way to work like that. Uh, well, from an artist standpoint, so you guys are used to VDB, but you know, Houdini, what, 12.5 just introduced, open, open VDB, yeah. and I mean, w you know what the benefits are, but like for people who haven't experienced that, what are the benefits of using that? On Turbo, we were on uh, Houdini 11, so we, have, uh, we had VDB, which was our internal version that then was open source. Uh, and uh, I think it was good, like we were the second show, or third show to use VDB. Um, so we inherited a lot of the development done by previous show that used it. Uh, but I, honestly, I think that for us was like, was seamless, we didn't have any problem and it was actually great, great to work with. Yeah, it seems like it makes a huge difference in Sims potentially more so than a lot of many other things, the Absolutely. benefits of doing that. I mean, we use a, a, a solver that uh, flux, that create fluid simulation, write VDBs and then we render VDB directly in Mantra, and uh, and it's very efficient, very fast, and it's, it's great. It's a great workflow. I mean, in fact, many other render now are adopting OpenVDB for this reason. So this is the car crash sequence. Um, it's like uh, toward the end of the movie, and one important thing that uh, um, that was told us it was not to use fire. So we didn't use fire because it was making the the, the sequence too frightening and and. We are making still a cartoon that uh, people need to enjoy. We didn't want to, to feel like uh, there was something bad going on. So we have a lot of smoke, a lot of debris, a lot of sparks, uh, but everybody's fine, nobody's hurt. And that was uh, the main point that makes sure that nobody scared. The smoke actually, the column smoke at the end was, done, was simulated once, very long simulation, because we have other two sequences where we see the smoke later. And we are just like instancing the smoke in different position and just rendering with, uh, with Mantra. We also have uh, built a pipeline to give like the lighting department a depth map that they can use that are generated from the smoke. In this case, are deep shadows. So they can re render their beauty passes using our uh, data to cast shadow. So to make the integration better. Um, most of the deb debris are like uh, RBDs and some are just particle simulation, and the big hero one are hands animated. One of the big new features of Dean 12.5 is support for OpenVDB, which brings great efficiency to the pipeline, and it saw its birth in technology here at DreamWorks. We talked with side effects about what was interesting and what was challenging, you know, even from a business perspective for us, and um, we felt like there was a really strong case for a stronger collaboration between DreamWorks and side effects. Uh, and part of that collaboration involves some technology transfer and, and uh, uh, VDB or open VDB as it turned into um, was, was a big piece of that. Um, I think SideFX was very interested in expanding their capabilities for volumetrics, um, they, you know, really being the, the premier uh, platform for doing volumetrics work. And uh, we feel that, you know, felt that we had a, a technology that was a really strong contender for that. Uh, and so that became a very natural thing for us to work together on. Um, uh, OpenVDB, which is the toolset that's supported in Houdini 12.5, is actually our third generation of that toolset internally. Um, so it's pretty mature at this point, although um, ironically, what's actually released in 12.5 um, will probably be tested by the rest of the world at about the same time that we're testing it internally. We're still going through our internal adoption process, but it includes all the best ideas that we've come up with over the last three or four years of, uh, of that development. It tries to address a type of effect that, that um, we encounter a lot in, uh, in, in animation and also live action, which is volumetric effects. So traditionally people have been using um, dense volumes. So basically you can think of your effects sort of being embedded or enclosed in a box. And even though the effect itself may be sort of spatially located, um, like a, a wisp or smoke, or even sometimes a liquid surface, um, everything needs to be in this one box. And that creates a huge memory uh, overhead or footprint. Um, and it also bogs down the, the actual computations because you have to traverse or visit every single value or voxel, as we, ca we call it. Voxel is sort of a 3D analogy to a 2D pixel. Um, so it's slow and it takes up a lot of memory. Um, so people have been experimenting with sort of alternatives. Of course, the alternative is to use what's called a sparse data structure. Um, and the idea behind it is you, you only allocate exactly what you need. Um, and there have been many different attempts to this. Sort of the classical attempts are 
on one side, you have um, tree-based methods like octrees. Octrees have been present in computer graphics for many, many years. Um, and the idea is that you, you have a tree, and at every single level, you split up um, basically in, in two child nodes in each coordinate dim dimension. So two times two times two is eight, hence octree. Um, and it works really well for certain applications, uh, like brick maps is an example that actually uses a, a render man's data structure. Um, the problem is that because of the fan out factor being so small, two in each coordinate dimension, um, it tends to create very, very tall trees. In other words, the path from the root node to the leaf node is very long. And that means um, data access can be very slow, especially a, a type of data access called random access. And random access basically means you are probing values based on coordinates. And that's, for instance, that's what we need when we do um, re rendering or ray tracing. So we shoot a ray through space. And as a ray progresses through space, um, we have to probe or extract values from the volume uh, based on coordinates. Um, so yeah, octrees, um, not a very good um, solution for, for many types of, of volumetric effects. Then people have been using what's called a tile grid. Um, so basically here you take, you take the big box and you subdivide it in, in some minor blocks. Um, and then you organize all the blocks in a table. Um, so essentially it's an extremely shallow tree because you have a root node and then you have blocks. And that suggests that uh, what's called random access, again, is very fast because the path from root to leaf is just one step. And it's true, it, it is very, very fast, but it doesn't scale. So in other words, if you want very, very high resolution, we're talking like tens of thousands of voxels in each coordinate dimension, it doesn't really scale. Um, so VDB essentially attempts to balance these two extremes. Um, and it's, it's difficult to sort of paid justice in a, in, a, in a few minutes. There's actually a SIGGRAPH paper that describes all the details, but it's a hierarchical data structure. Um, it's shallow in the sense that it typically only has four levels, um, but it's also very, very wide as opposed to an octree. So the fan out factor between each level is very high. Um, interestingly, it's, it's, a, it's a technique people have been using in um, databases for, for quite a long time. It's called a B plus tree. Um, like the Oracle database uses it, or file systems use it too in TFS. Um, and the idea is you have a shallow tree that is very wide, um, and the wideness gives you the scalability. So you can have massive amounts of data in there. Um, and the shallow, the fact that it's shallow means it has very fast uh, random access. Um, and then, of course, we have a whole tool set on top of it that sort of utilizes some of these ideas. So the, the main idea is very small memory footprint and very fast processing because you only have to touch or massage the values that you actually allocate in the data structure. So the, uh, the diagram illustrates these different blocks or levels in the, in the tree. Um, the big blocks, actually the, the largest block, the root node, you can't even see it. That's how big it is. Um, and then below that, you have, uh, yeah, I think there are two, two levels of, of blocks uh, that progressively uh, smaller, and then at the very um, smallest resolution, you have the leaf nodes. In this case, the leaf nodes are eight by eight by eight voxels, um, so very very small tiles, and they actually contain the uh, in this case voxels. It's a signed distance field. So we took in this case we took a mesh, a polygonal mesh, and we compute the closest distance to the mesh, um, but we only compute it in close proximity of the surface itself. So it actually produces what's called a narrow band level set. Um, it's very, very compact. Um, this particular volume is about 8,000 times 5 times, I can't remember, a few thousand in, in the other direction. Um, and it would have required half a terabyte using uh, dense grids. And yet for VDB, it's less than a, a gigabyte. So it's quite a memory saving. Then, of course, you can, another key feature of VDB is that the volume can change, it can be dynamic. Um, that's some of the, the caveats of. Uh, earlier attempts to do sparse data structures, but they were very compact, but they only supported static volumes. So once you start moving, you know, moving surfaces or, or particles around, you'd have to regenerate everything. Um, in VDB, we can actually dynamically allocate and deallocate elements. So it lends itself really well to, um, 
like fluids and, and particle animation. It seems like an ideal case because you're generating so much data through the sims and then reducing right. that for interactivity. I mean, there's a good example actually here. Um, there's a good example of a side-by-side -side of what it used to take to actually take the particle sim and turn it into surface too. That's right. So uh, it's, it's an example. It's actually a real world example where some of the artists were experimenting with um, skinning of, of particle based uh, fluid simulations. Um, we had, I think, about two or three million particles that are animated. Um, and the challenge, of course, is to create a liquid surface from that. So skinning, basically. Um, and using Houdini 11, that was based on tile grids, um, the only way that could actually achieve this was to partition the particles in bins, uh, I think about 30 different bins, and farm them out to uh, different computers. And every computer would then process sort of a subset of the particles, and you'd merge everything. And it was a process that took 30 minutes per, uh, per node. Uh, and now we can do the same thing in VDB on a single machine in about 10 seconds. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a, a win. Yeah, definitely a win for the artist, isn't it? Um, you mentioned Houdini. Well, how did that process start out? How did this, I mean, partnership of sorts, I think, would be a good way. How did, how did this come about? From the very beginning, we integrated it in Houdini, and we actually realized that we spend the majority of our resources sort of supporting the integration itself as opposed to the library. So it's really a win-win for us to um, sort of hand over um, a lot of the tools, and they're maintaining the nodes, uh, and that sort of allows us to... Uh, focus more on the library and the tool set itself. Um, it's been very, very interesting for both parties uh, and, and very useful for the, uh, for the artist as well, because now things are sort of first class citizens of Houdini, meaning um, you, they can use a lot of the other tools that Houdini offer and pair it up with, with uh, the VDB volume that's actually a native primitive. So they can group them, you know, they can render them in Mantra and things like that. Yeah, what would, it, what would an example workflow be within an artist using it within Houdini? So you, I mean, typically you would work in SOPs, so surface operators. Um, typically you start out with some other uh, geometry representation like uh, a mesh that's moving or particles or sometimes even curves. Um, and then you turn it into a volume, uh, a process that we call scan conversion. Uh, we have various uh, tools to do this, um, and they all use VDB underneath. Um, so you literally have your geometry coming in, you drop down a, a node, a, a VDB node, um, and it would either be from particles or from mesh or some of the other tools. Um, and you define the resolution, the voxel resolution. Um, you can do velocity streaking, uh, the different options, of course. Um, we can even, even um, bake out the attributes. Let's say the, the, the mesh comes in with texture attributes. We can bake them out as volumes as well. Um, and then in the GDP that sort of connects the different nodes, flows the different volumes, the VDB volumes. And then you can go in and out of, of VDB land as, as you want. You can go back again to polygons when you render, or you can render it directly in Mantra. Uh, there are many different options. But it's very sort of very seamless integration. So if you're, if you're an artist looking, you fire up Houdini, 12.5 for the first time, you say, I want to check out this open VDB thing. I mean, what, what's, the, what's the benefit for the artist? I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the sell point to get them to use it? Uh, it's very, very fast. Uh, for instance, the, the process of converting a mesh into uh, a sign distance field would take minutes in, in the old Houdini, uh, with the old Houdini tool set, and it's literally seconds now. Um, you can crank up resolution uh, much, much higher. In fact, there is, there is sort of a caveat because sometimes, because it's so easy to create these massive volumes, sometimes it bites you when you then try to go back again. So when you kind of very high resolution volume, and at some point you decide, I want to mesh it because I don't know, I don't want to, I want to texture it or I want to render it or whatever. And that process of converting it back can suddenly kill your machine because it produces so many polygons. So you have to be a little bit careful sometimes. Oh, and I should have said at the start, if you want to follow us on Twitter, and you are not, we are at FX Guide News, or on Facebook, just go to facebook.com slash FX Guide, where we post not only FX Guide, but also FX PhD news and updates. Well, until next time, see ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.